In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lecture for the Intercession of the Saints, the Kingdom Rule, Exercised. In our previous lectures, we stated a theme of the Old Testament is the inheritance of God, the glory of God. It's a connecting string throughout the biblical narrative. Adam, like Melchizedek of Genesis 14, was a king and priest. As a king, he forfeited his reign and was brought into subjection to the malignant spiritual powers and subject to death. We see this in Galatians 4.4 4 and Ephesians 2 and several other passages. As a priest, he failed to offer to God the creation and to sacrifice. The communion with God then ruptured and creation subject to bondage. The last Adam is born and inherits the kingdom. All things put under his feet, as Psalm 8 tells us. As a priest, he offers to God the Father all and thus restores a created order so that it can become uncreated. We explain in Lecture 2 that the Lord takes human nature on himself and imbues it with his glory. We partake of his nature by the Eucharist and so become partakers of this divine nature. We are priests perpetually offering ourselves back to our Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yet we are also kings. And this is where we will focus this lecture. God promised to make a people for himself. He would exercise his rule, his kratos, in the midst of them. This is really what the message of Christ was, submission to the Vasilia to Theu, submission to the kingdom, the reign of God. Submission to a servant king and allowing him to reign in our hearts. For as Paul said in his letter to the Romans, the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom has its capital not in Constantinople or Moscow or even the earthly Jerusalem. Nay, brethren, the seat of this kingdom is the heavenly Jerusalem. I has not seen, but the Spirit has tasted it. There is a city, the new Jerusalem, which we will inhabit. The scripture says this, God sits in the sides of the north. This is a reference to the Jerusalem above. This city is our mother. Paul says Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. This city has as its king Jesus, the royal priest, over the royal priesthood. His throne is in his temple. His temple is described. If we care to believe it, it resembles the Orthodox temple. The church in her inspiration has patterned her politia, her manner of life, on the patterns in both the Old and New Testaments. Before this temple there are gates. Beyond them is a temple. Within this temple is the king and the lamb who sits, both as at the right hand of the father and is before the throne as the lamb. He is thus the priest king. The altar is burning and incense is placed on it, namely the prayers of the saints. Behind the altar are the twenty-four courses of presbyters, which correspond with the elders of the Old Testament dispensation. They are clothed in white. They are crowned. This point I will make here is very important. The kingdom is not a mere future millennium. This is heresy. Christ reigns now. He is on the throne, and people reign with him currently. The saints are specifically said to reign with Christ. And therefore, John said in his apocalypse, God loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests. We reign now over the spiritual realms. In this light, look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul says Christ has raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In heavenly places even now we are seated with him and reign over the spiritual realm, although it is in part now. With his understanding, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic, and I dare say some Lutherans, have always held some saints have been exalted to reign now. This explains the passage in Matthew 20 where the mother of Zebedee's sons come to Jesus and ask, Let me start with verse 20. 
Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asked something of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? He said, They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is given for those for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. If we turn our eye to the iconostasis in the Orthodox Church, we see Christ and then John the Baptist on the left and the Mother of God on the right. The reason why the mother of Zebedee's uh, children was refused was the positions were already taken. The greatest among women is seated at the right hand of the king, like it was prophesied in Psalm 45. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. Now notice this. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. The mother of God, like a queen, was at the right hand. John is the greatest among men. Like Jesus said, there has not risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. We believe, like Christians have always believed, that this kingdom has a request department, if you will. The administration of its justice. God's representatives can be appealed to like the representatives of the king were appealed to in the Old Testament. The parallel is found in the reign of Solomon. His mother was the queen at his right hand and had full audience with the king. And the account says this. Now the background is David was uh, a dying and uh, now there is vying for the throne and power this is in first kings 2 13 and it says now adonijah the son of haggith came to bathsheba the mother of solomon so she said do you come peaceably and he said peaceably moreover he said i have something to say to you and she said say it then he said you know that the kingdom was mine and all israel had their expectations on me that i should reign however the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brothers for it was from the lord Now I ask you one petition of you. Do not deny me. And she said to him, Say it. Then he said, Please speak to King Solomon, for he will not refuse you, that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite as wife. So Bathsheba said, Very well, I will speak for you to the king. Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, and the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her and sat down on his throne, and had a throne set for the king's mother. So she sat at his right hand. Then she said, I desire one small petition of you, do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Ask it, my mother, for I will not refuse you. So she said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as a wife. Here we have a very interesting account. That parallels what we as Orthodox Christians and even Catholics believe about the saints. This kingdom of God is not merely a future figment of our imaginations. It is presently entered into now and the saints in heaven request from God blessings for us. And the analogy is The queen at the right hand is not Bathsheba now, but the mother of God, Mary. 
and at the left hand is his best man, the forerunner, John the Baptist. And there is a choros tonagion, a choir of the saints surrounding the throne, a heavenly throng. We read of this heavenly court in the book of Kings as well, but that would be a, a digression from what we're talking about now. We understand this also from John chapter 2. John chapter 2, the first miracle is recorded. And we see the parisia or the boldness which the Lord's mother had. And the text reads this, verse 1. And the third day there was a wedding in Cain of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were called to the wedding. And when they had wanted wine, the mother of Jesus says to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to a woman, what do you have to do? do with me mine hour is not yet come his mother said to his servants whatever he says to you do it and they did do it and jesus did what she requested just like solomon did not refuse his mother so jesus did not refuse his mother for a greater than solomon is here If the lesser would not refuse his mother, much more the greater will not refuse his mother. The intercession of the saints is described again in the book of Revelation. In Revelation we read in chapter 8 that the saints pray for us. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the angels who stood before God, and them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and threw it into the earth, and there were noises and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. Some saints appear to have more favor with God than others. Biblically, this is true. Now, we can all pray to God and beseech Him, and God as our Heavenly Father loves us all, but... There is a sense in which some of his people have a boldness and approach to him that others do not. This idea that we can approach God flippantly and without fear is a very modernistic idea. I would dare say most reformers did not act this way, but this is the logical conclusion of their rejection of the Bible. We see in the book of Job, the sufferings of Job, and at the end of his suffering in chapter 42, God appears to his friends and to Job. Job's Job's friends desire to approach God. And the Lord says this, 42.7, And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Tamanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. Why? For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Notice that these people had to have the intercession of another person, even though we can acknowledge there's only one mediator between God and man. We know that. But yet in the administration of God's kingdom and the blessings on the earth, there is a sense in which we as kings and priests are allowed to exercise that.
Let me leave you with a couple concluding thoughts. Something to think on. Number one, the first great lesson to draw from this is saints are connected to us in heaven. We are one body with them. Secondly, we are encouraged by this example of saints approaching God and having favor with him to grow in grace and in favor with God. Thirdly, prayers are heard. Prayers are effectual. They move mountains. We cannot doubt. We reign in heaven now, and we should not give up advancing Christ's work in the midst of his people. But let me leave you with one other thought. We live in a very individualistic, atomistic world where we no longer have a sense of community. God in his economia, his plan of salvation, uses the requests of people to save others. And sometimes he saves them uh, on the basis of their faith, not the faith of the person who's suffering. Let me give you an example. Read Mark chapter 2. There was a man who was sick, palsy, and it says that they could, the the man, um, when they could not come nigh, this is in Capernaum, he goes to Capernaum, he enters into the city, the the crowds are about him, and it says, uh, and they come unto him, bring him sick of the palsy, and when they could not bring him in, they broke up the house. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. The sins of the person were forgiven because of the prayers, in effect, the action, the faith of others. The saints pray for us. And in that light, the fact that God connects us by community and helps us sometimes despite ourselves, let's not reject this ancient piety of the church that we are one body praying for one another, but let us strive to understand it and grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God. Have mercy on us and save us. Amen.